Welcome, everyone. We're excited to begin this, the second of our webinars in the Global Boyhood Initiative webinar series. Um, this particular session on boys in education is inspired by new studies that came out from UNESCO and the World Bank, affirming that in more than 100 countries around the world, depending on the indicators used, of course, boys are faring worse than girls in school, and that across um, all ages of school age children, boys are now slightly more than half of those who are out of school. We want to bring a nuanced reflection to those findings, and we have authors from those two studies who will be with us on this session. Um, we know that that conclusion, of course, doesn't tell the complexity across boys and girls and is only part of the story of gender as it plays out in the education sector. Um, we step into this conversation um, with the belief that this cannot be seen as a zero-sum game. It's not about looking at boys versus girls, but, it, but that we must hold three things in our heads at the same time, and we actually believe we can do that. First, we need to push back on any conclusion that somehow this means that the attention to girls' education um, needs to go away. We very much believe that girls' education still matters. Gender inequality, the structural inequalities that girls face at school, and the barriers into entering paid work, the, un, the unequal care burden on that starts in gir with girls and continues with adult women, all these issues and more, including the harassment and violence that girls too often face at the hands of boys in schools. All of these issues tell us that we're not done with the things that need to be done for girls in school. Second, we do have to acknowledge that some boys um, in all of their diversity are facing real challenges in schools. What the two reports, and you'll hear from the authors again, tell us is how much income and poverty and other factors also matter. So this is not only about saying boys v girls in schools, it's also looking at it from an intersectional approach. We know that specific groups of boys and girls whether those are from historically marginalized ethnic groups, the lowest income boys and girls, immigrant groups and others face particularly difficult um, situations in the education system. And third, we need to keep a relational lens on this. As we talk about boys, both in the Global Boyhood Initiative and in this panel and in the research that comes out, what happens to boys matters for girls, what happens to girls matters for boys. Our solutions will not be in the separation, but to understand the common challenges that are there. Um, we know from our research from the International Men and Gender Equality Survey that boys or men who finish secondary education have healthier and more equitable ideas about masculinities and are also less likely to use some forms of violence. So we, that matters directly in the lives of women and girls, and it matters for boys and men themselves. And then we also emphasize that it's relational in the sense that Politically, these issues need to be kept together. This is not about separating what happens to boys and girls, but to see what the common cause is, and also to understand boys as relational in terms of their learning. And here I cite one of our board members, Michael Reichert, who's talked a lot about how much we strip away from boys somehow their idea that their learning and their, and their identities and who they are is connected to others. So as we think about solutions, we want to lean into that, looking at the relational aspect of this, both at the policy level and at the level of individual boys and girls. As I said at the beginning, this webinar is part of the Global Boyhood Initiative, which is a multi-country advocacy research and program implementation initiative created by Equimundo and by the Caring Foundation, and now led by Equimundo in partnership with our anchor partners, Plan International and Gillette. We're thrilled to get started in this, um, the work you'll hear more about the Global Boyhood Initiative um, coming up. But with that, I want to hand it over to Giovanna Lauro, who's the Deputy CEO at Equimundo and has led our efforts internationally to uh, with the Global Boyhood Initiative. Giovanna, over to you. Thank you so much, Gary, and hi, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be part of this conversation. I'm just going to talk for five minutes before we actually start the conversation with the speakers. And for these five minutes, I really want to focus on what we would like to be the two key takeaways from this webinar, at least from our perspective, really focusing first on why we're talking about boys in education within a gender equality lens, 
And also, what exactly are we talking about? What are the concrete actions? What are the best practices that we want to see in the world? So with regard to the first point, the why, I think you'll hear our speakers here um, bring together two crucially complementary perspectives. That is, the first reason is that engaging boys in education from a gender equality perspective is good for gender equality. You've just heard Gary talk about data from the International Men and Gender Equality Survey. Investing in boys' education pays off in terms of greater support for gender equality and um, greater gender equitable behaviors. We also know from a broader body of research that in order to change manhood, in order to change the ways in which uh, young men are socialized, we need to start early. And that's why the Boyhood Initiative starts as young as four. And in some countries like Mexico, we are about to start working with um, our NGO partner, Hendes, with boys as young as three in daycares with support from the FEMSA Foundation. And as we talk about this, um, it's important to engage boys for gender equality. Also, if we think about the fact that it's not fair to put all the burden of change on girls' shoulders. It's not fair, and it's also not effective enough. We are seeing the backlash that is happening globally across so many different contexts. And so that's why we need to bring boys and future men on board in the fight for gender equality. So that's the first why. The second why is that uh, engaging boys in uh, education within a gender equality framework is good for boys themselves. We cannot shy away from saying this. And we also need uh, to, uh, to say that uh, boys experience certain vulnerabilities uh, that may not be fully addressed by gender blind programs. As we'll hear from our colleagues at UNESCO and the World Bank, uh, there are specific vulnerabilities, specific issues around um, uh, school participation, school retention, learning, including social emotional learning that need to be addressed uh, for boys, just as we do uh, for girls. And within this context, of course, a nuanced understanding is really important. Along with the global data, we really need to dig deeper into the country-specific context to understand the gender power dynamics. And so as part of that, I wanted to flag to you all a series of reports that we started in 2020 about the state of boys in specific country, countries. We started in the US, um, in partnership with, uh, in, with the support from the Caring Foundation, we have then also expanded this series of studies to other countries in partnership, for instance, with Plan International in Italy, in Ecuador, in Bolivia. Um, a study has been launched recently in the UK. Uh, more is coming out in the future in France, as well as an upcoming study in Mexico with a focus specifically of bo on boys and the education sector. So all of this will be available on the Global Boyhood Initiative website, and I wanted to flag it to you as a resource for the future. And then to conclude my second point, so the first one we talked about the why, the second core takeaways that I hope you'll bring home with you after this is really about the what. What is that we're talking about in terms of concrete actions that we can um, take? Uh, well, the first one is that really what we're talking about here is gender transformative. Uh, interventions. I know that our colleagues from Ongai have a lot to say around this. How can we fight um, gender stereotypes and harmful gender norms in schools that is not just sensitizing boys and girls about the benefits of gender equality, but really changing the gender power dynamics. To do this, we need to work with boys. We need to work also with girls because girls and women can also be um, internalizing harmful notions of femininity and masculinity. And room to read, uh, we'll have a lot to say about what they're doing on this around the world. And finally, we need to work with the ecosystem in which boys live. We need to work with their families, we need to work with their teachers, with their coaches, with the communities, with the institutions in which they live, including schools. And that's exactly what the Global Boyhood Initiative is about, working with boys and the ecosystems in which they live to promote sustainable change around gender equality. With this, I uh, will end here and I will give the floor back to Gary. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks, Giovanna, for setting up um, the background on the Global Boyhood Initiative. And I want to turn over now to our panelists. We want to hear first from these two landmark studies from UNESCO and the World Bank, 
and then from other colleagues who have been so crucial in the, um, the, the push for gender transformative education. Um, so I wanna turn over now to Matthias Eck. Matthias is a program specialist in the section of uh, education for inclusion and gender at UNESCO. He and I see other um, partners of his from UNESCO are online and participating as well. Matthias and team have led this landmark report um, on boys and education that UNESCO put out last year. Um, Matthias, the question to you is, you've come out with this landmark report on, about gender and education with a focus on boys, um, with lots of recommendations as well. It's not just pointing out the problem, but a huge um, focus of the report on recommendations. So uh, over to you, tell us what the headlines of the report are and um, tell us what the key recommendations are that you come out with. Thank you very much, Gary. And I think uh, there's a PowerPoint that you will share from your end. So while we are pulling this up, um, I'm really delighted to share the results of the UNESCO Global Report on Boys' Engagement from Education with you. Now, this report focuses on countries and contexts where boys are struggling to access education and progress. And I would like to make three key points uh, today. If we move on uh, to the next slide, the first point I would like to make is on the global situation of boys' education. Now, although girls have more difficulty accessing education in the first place, boys face increasing challenges as education moves further. As the report shows, boys are at greater risk of repeating grades, failing to progress and complete their education. The report finds that boys are more likely than girls to repeat primary grades in 130 out of 142 countries. And in 73 countries, less boys than girls are enrolled in upper secondary education. Globally, 88 men are enrolled at university for every 100 women. And in all regions, except Sub-Saharan Africa, young men are at disadvantage in tertiary enrollment. When it comes to learning outcomes, 10-year-old boys fare worse than girls in mastering reading skills in countries with data. Now, the figures released uh, just a couple of months ago show that there are now about 190 million girls out of school versus 126 million boys. And the biggest share of out of uh, school um, children, boys, sorry, is concentrated at the upper secondary level. And while previously boys' disengagement dropout was a concern mainly in high-income countries, it's now in several low- and middle-income countries uh, that have seen a reversal in gender gaps, with boys now lagging behind girls in enrollment and completion. Now, gender parity is only one measure. It is necessary but not sufficient to achieve gender equality. And therefore, the report not only combined quantitative and qualitative research, but it also included several national case studies and they were based on in-depth interviews and focus group discussions at school. I would like to share one quite moving quote from these. An adolescent boy said, and I quote, I still remember the hitting. In grade five, I had a teacher who for some reason hated me and made me hate studying. As a result, I became stubborn and refused to study. I still remember the teacher once brought an electric cable and had two boys hold me and he hit my legs with a wire to the point where I couldn't walk. Now, if we move on to the next slide, um, the second point I would like to make is on the reasons why so many boys are disengaged from education. Now, the report finds multiple factors um, combined to prevent boys from engaging fully with learning and contribute to boys exiting education early. You can see them on the slide, and I would like to highlight a few. Poverty mentioned by Gary in the beginning is an important factor. Now, gendered norms and expectations impact on boys' motivation, desire to learn. For example, in several countries, boys are expected to become breadwinners and leave school early for work. In many contexts, school activities in certain subjects are considered at odds with the expressions of masculinity, making education unpopular with boys. And there are practices such as gender segregation that contribute to boys' low motivation, underachievement, and disengagement from education. Harsh discipline, Corporal punishment and other forms of school-related gender-based violence impact negatively on boys' academic achievement and attainment. And fear and experience of violence lead to increased absenteeism and may contribute to dropout. And boys are also more likely than girls to experience physical bullying, and they are often also targeted because of their real or perceived sexual orientation and gender identity or expression. Uh, if we move on to the next slide, the third point I would like to address is why all this matters and what we can do about it. 
So we know that globally severe gender gaps in economic participation and opportunity as well as political empowerment at women's expense persist and the latter gap is even growing. We also know that girls often face greater threats to their rights, yet addressing boys' engagement from education matters. As this report shows, supporting boys is not a zero-sum game, and Gary mentioned it in the beginning. Targeted action in favor of boys does not mean that girls lose out or vice versa. On the contrary, it not only benefits boys' learning, employment opportunities, income and well-being, but it is also highly beneficial for achieving gender equality and desirable economic, social and health outcomes. And all of this is benefiting girls, boys and society as a whole. The report shows that comprehensive policies to address boys' engagement from education are very rare at the country level, and they are pre predominantly found in high income countries. And therefore, the report makes a comprehensive set of recommendations on how to best um, address the issue. Let me quickly highlight a few overarching recommendations. If you move on the next slide, first, we need to advance equal access to education and prevent boys dropout. Secondly, we need to make learning gender transformative, safe and inclusive for all learners. And thirdly, we need to invest in better data and generate evidence to better understand boys' educational participation, progression and learning outcomes, including the most marginalized boys. Fourthly, we need to build and finance equitable, inclusive and gender transformative education systems. And this includes investing significantly in education with a focus on girls and boys most in need. And lastly, we need to promote and ensure an integrated, coordinated and system-wide approach to address boys' disengagement from education. And I would like to invite all of you to read the report to see the whole list of recommendations. I think the link was posted in the chat box. And just to conclude, on a final note, UNESCO believes that education must be improved for male, female and non-binary learners, leaving no one behind. And we strongly believe that the right to education must be realized for all. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. And I, I want to commend you and your colleagues for um, for acknowledging just the the complexity of the issue. If you're if I recall the number on your slide about the factors that are driving um, boys' educational challenges, I think there were 15 plus factors listed there. And I think we so often in kind of our in our desire to come up with solutions, you know, just look for a single story here. And I, I commend you. Um, for looking at just how complex the issue is. And also in terms of the recommendations, I think particularly the ones that focus on gender transformative approaches and also systems wide approaches. I think many of the solutions that are being proposed in say aspects of the popular press look at, hey, we can find one thing. There must be something essential or essential list about boys that needs to be fixed. And there's some simplistic solution. And I um, again, I think it's important that you have highlighted the complexity of it, the need for systems wide approaches. Um, and and for inclusive, not simply boy specific policies. Um, with that, I want to turn it over now to Laura Gregory. Laura is a senior education specialist in the World Bank's education global practice. Um, Laura, like UNESCO, um, and with similar timing, the World Bank came out with a report on boys education, um, a landmark report within the World Bank, and the first time the bank has looked at this issue as well. Um, tell us the bank's take on this. What are the what are the ways in which you looked at the issues um, as a key global actor in education practice and finance around the world? And what are the implications of your research in terms of education policy? Uh, thank you, Gary. Um, and uh, good morning, um, good afternoon, good evening um, to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today and to share in this um, discussion. Um, just over a year ago, my colleague Michelle Wellmond and I published this global report at the World Bank on educational underachievement among boys and men, um, where we came up with many of the same conclusions as the UNESCO report, as Matthias has described. Um, just before uh, I talk a little bit about how we looked at the issue and the implications, um, I'd like to say that it's great to see um, so many institutions represented um, here today working on these issues and creating space for discussing boys learning um, as we can't ignore the data any longer and even though it still comes as a as a shock to so many people. Um, so quite similar to the UNESCO report, in our report we describe the issue of educational underachievement um, as being one of three things. Um, firstly, low levels of participation in education, 
Secondly, low rates of education completion or graduation. And thirdly, low student learning outcomes. And we then looked at the phenomenon or prevalence of educational underachievement among boys and men, um, why it matters, what explains it, uh, what is being done about it, and a proposed uh, way forward. Um, next slide, please. In terms of the phenomenon, uh, Matthias has already covered some of the most important findings, but I'll just reiterate, reiterate a couple um, through our graphics. Um, and we do use, uh, in some cases, some slightly different indicators. Um, we see that in more than 100 countries, boys are less likely to be enrolled in secondary education. And as you can see here, um, young men are less likely to be enrolled in tertiary education. And on top of that, the proportions finishing their programs in tertiary education are substantially lower than for women. Um, and for high income countries, you can see uh, in the green there, um, it's not a new development, but it appears that the occurrence of this gap has become increasingly common in middle income countries. Uh, next slide, please. And the issue starts much younger. The learning poverty rate, which is the percentage of children unable to read a simple text uh, with understanding by the time they are 10, is higher for boys and girls in almost all of the approximately 100 countries um, of the world for which learning poverty data is available. And it's especially an, uh, an issue in the Middle East and North Africa region and the East Asia and Pacific region and among middle income countries. Um, and we see these differences also in science, especially at the secondary school level and to a lesser extent in mathematics. And also while boys appear to perform um, better on problem solving skills, they underperform on average in collaborative problem solving. Um, and that's a gap that is even larger than the one for reading. In terms of why this matters, our report discusses it um, in terms of being a break on human capital development. And we provide estimates of the effect on countries' productivity if the underachievement of boys was eradicated, if, if they, they achieved as well as girls did in each country. Um, we also look at the social and political um, consequences. Uh, next slide, please. Then in terms of um, what explains it, we structured our report within a framework consisting of three key elements. Firstly, labor market influences that contribute to underachievement. Secondly, uh, social norms that might encourage or reinforce underachievement. And thirdly, characteristics of educational processes or teaching and learning that may unintentionally promote underachievement. And given that today's webinar is um, focused on gender transformative education, I'm going to focus just on the last one, um, specifically on teaching and learning. And next slide, please. We found that the commonly held belief that boys and girls have different learning styles and that instruction needs to match those styles um, is not based on evidence. Uh, instead, we found that it was useful to examine what boys bring to their schooling experience compared to girls, um, that is their prior knowledge and skills, and the degree to which they engage in learning, uh, which can be affected by social norms. There is some evidence that boys begin formal education with less developed social and behavioral skills, and that some of these differences can affect educational achievement. But there's also strong evidence to suggest that um, these non-cognitive skills are malleable and dependent on the environment. We found that there's little and mixed evidence to support the theory that boys are inherently less motivated than girls to achieve at school. In terms of the classroom, we saw that there is little support for the idea of boy-friendly or girl-friendly pedagogies, and that those pedagogies that appeal to boys are just as girl-friendly. In fact, they characterize um, quality teaching. The school and classroom climate appears to be important for all kids and especially for boys. Um, for example, schools with mostly boys, uh, more than 60%, were less likely to have positive reports of the disciplinary um, climate. And there's evidence that disciplinary problems uh, in the classroom have a bigger impact on boys' performance. And we also see a greater sense of belonging among all girls schools, particularly in the countries that uh, have mostly single sex schooling. And I think one of the most interesting findings is that boys seem to be more affected by school quality, more harmed by bad schools, and more likely to gain from good schools. Um, in terms of uh, some of the implications of these findings, um, uh, next slide, please. Um, we can see that engaging boys in the learning process really is crucial, but it's also not something new. Um, the approaches to teaching and learning that are known to be effective for all students are all relevant to discussion of boys learning and to any children and young people at risk of poor educational outcomes. With school and classroom climates having a greater impact on boys, 
Uh, we think working with school leadership becomes very important, um, not exclusively for the purpose of raising boys' attainment, but because it's important for all students. And we mentioned in our report some of the types of whole school systematic approaches to help improve um, climate. Um, we note that some of the efforts that have been made to engage boys in reading, um, given it's such a fundamental uh, skill um, affecting other learning, including evidence on the importance of offering a wide variety of texts and giving space to talk and reflect on reading. And making sure that boys don't fall too far behind appears to be crucial. But of course, um, sometimes regular schooling just doesn't work and alternative, less formal education paths um, have been found to be successful for some boys. <clears throat> we do think that a lot more research is needed, um, but from what is available, we've concluded that what works for girls learning is also good for boys learning, though it may not be sufficient to help boys achieve better outcomes. Um, back to you, Gary, and I look forward to hearing from the others. Thank you. Thanks for those conclusions, Lord. I just wanted to call attention. Um, first, I think it's very important that you question this idea that somehow boys learn inherently differently and that we need some boy specific pedagogy. Um, I think the conclusion that good schooling is good for girls and boys, quality education works for both and that there's nothing um, inherent or essentially different in the way that boys and girls learn, I think is key. Because um, I think so often we find ourselves sort of pushed into those simplistic solutions. For So thank you for that. And I think it also helps us keep a focus on saying it's not about, you know, um, boys step into the education system with somehow some inherent def deficits or that boys learn differently than girls, um, but that we probably have many external factors that mean um, that we need to pay attention to as they affect the school system. So thank you for that. Um, I now want to turn to uh, Antara Ganguly, who is the head of the UN Girls Education Initiative, um, which has been at the forefront of the UN's work to say, what is happening to girls in school? How do we achieve full gender equality and gender just education systems? Antara, thanks for joining us today. You've heard about these two reports. I know that you know the, the findings and conclusions in them. Um, would love your take on it. We know that education is only one of the vulnerabilities that you look at in terms of girls and children in general. Um, and what do you think the UN and the multilateral system should do with such a complex, problematic um, conversation around gender and gender transformative education? Thank you so much for that, Gary. Thank you for having us here. Uh, thank you, Matthias and Laura, for sharing the findings from your reports. Um, I'm very, very happy to hear um, the focus on LGBTQI learners. Uh, the UN has definitely not been at the forefront and standing up for the needs of these children. So I'm really happy that my colleague brought that up. Um, if we could share the, the slides, Caroline. So I'll start with this slide. This is an analysis of Disney animated movies broken down by the amount of screenplay, so voice of um, different characters in the movies and gender balances. Now this analysis is from 2016 and I can see that the source is missing and we can, we can share that. And I am the mother of a three-year-old. And so this is, it makes me angry, but it also makes me think how much harder my life would be in raising a feminist child had I had a son, because when I have a daughter and then she's watching these movies, I know what I am going to tell her. I, I know what she needs to hear. I know what she needs to see. I know that because I've spent my whole life doing that. But it made me realize when I was preparing for this webinar that actually, what would I have told my daughter if she had been a boy? Because this, what this graph is showing in that even in movies that are about strong women and girls like Mulan, Mushu, her protector dragon, played by Eddie Murphy, has 50% more words than Mulan herself. I mean, talk about mansplaining. So the reason I'm, bring, I'm, I'm, I'm starting with this and answering your question, Gary, is that there is something we need to do Boys, in a way, have a harder journey in some ways getting to gender equality than girls because they are growing up 
with everything around them telling them that their voice, their agency, their decisions are the main actions, not just in movies, which we're seeing here, but we've also seen analysis of children's picture books where 80% of animals are male and the ones that are females are usually mothers or babies. And there's also analysis on video games showing that. And while this is a privilege that being a protagonist is powerful, it's also a burden. And that's the amazing work that Ekni Mundo and others have been doing around, and around dismantling the boxes of masculinity because power is not everything and yet boys are taught that it is. Laura talked about how boys benefit differently from good schools and bad schools. The analysis in the US has shown for three decades now that girls actually have higher self-esteem and, ha and have better math and um, STEM scores when they go to all girls schools. Boys have worse when they go to all boys schools. So what this says to me is the, the socialization that children are going through, not just in schools, but outside schools and families and communities in front of TVs where children spend a lot of time on their phones is critical to solving the, the inequities and the underachievements that are happening in school for girls, but also for boys. And today we're talking about boys and, and hence I wanted to start by making this point. In the eighties, we used to have the slogan when we marched that said, it's not um, love of power, it's power of love. And this is where we don't talk about things like love in, in international development, but boys don't get talked to about love enough and they are talked to about power, perhaps way too much. If we can move to the next slide and then I'll, I'll stop. This is an illustration and I'll, I'll pop the link in the chat. We've been talking a lot about vulnerabilities and um, well, we've been talking a lot about educational achievement. I wanted to provide a little bit of context um, that educational achievement is one part of a child or a person's experiences uh, and their vulnerabilities and the opportunities that they face. So you can't see it very well in the slide. If you click on the link, you can, you can see the poster. We've laid out some of the vulnerabilities that children face around the world, girls and boys. It's not exhaustive. There are other vulnerabilities and opportunities too that can go on there. But this is to just place into context that yes, in, in many countries, uh, in some countries, boys are out of school more than girls. What does that mean for the, the situation? We have to put that in the context of the situation and context and opportunities and vulnerabilities that that child faces in their entire life, not just related to going to school and graduating from school. Um, I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thanks for that. Antar, and I, I appreciate in particular thinking about um, what is the, the social world of boys and girls outside of school and just the, the gendered messages and the harmful gendered messages and world that boys and girls are in that obviously in, um, affects the education sector. And also just to say thank you for including, um, you know, thinking about, we often think about a ped pedagogy for success, a pedagogy for entering the workplace, but a pedagogy for human connection and love, um, I think we too often don't think about. And I think for boys in particular, um, we've seen in our own research just how much the ideas about manhood kind of strip that out of us as boys and men. And I think that's so key with so many implications for us as, um, as men and women and non-binary individuals. Um, and then I also wanted to say, you know, thank you for bringing up just, you know, how much we know that our children are consuming of media and their online worlds and what they see there that is gendered. Um, we've been looking at a little bit at some of the content part as we look at how much the the protagonist and dialogue is from male characters, but also to say, what's the content of that? And our analysis of what boys and men are watching says, there's a lot of men talking, what are they saying? They're showing dominance, they're showing harm, they're showing emotional incompetence, um, they're showing an inability to solve problems that doesn't involve the use of violence or force. Um, and so there's harm to be found, um, even in the fact those are mostly male, male characters speaking. I think one, you know, it leads to somehow this idea that the only voice in the room can be um, coming from men, but it's also what is said in those voices is really, really harmful. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, Just wanna... one point to what you said, Gary. Yes, in fact, emotional incompetence is celebrated. Yeah. You know, it's 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 a, it's a mark of masculinity, and yeah. and that is such it's a heartbreaking loss for boys to learn yeah. that. Agreed. 
Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, I want to turn now to Lucina Demeco. She's the Vice President of Girls Education and Gender at, and Equality at Room to Read, um, which is a partner of uh, the Global Boyhood Initiative and has been focusing a lot on girls education globally. And um, Lucina, your um, Room to Read has focused with, with, um, with great success in many countries on girls education. Um, how are you thinking about and what brought you now to think about boys' education in these conversations and in your programming? Thank you so much, Gary. I'm thrilled to be here and thrilled to be talking to you a little bit about how our process has been in terms of starting the work with boys around gender equality and masculinity, and also how this has improved and changed really the, also the way we look at girls' education and our work with girls. I'll be sharing... A couple of slides only to guide me through this conversation and then looking forward to then the discussion. So for over 20 years, Room to Read has worked on girls education and gender equality, really seeing education as a key to end the gender inequality in the world. We have supported girls to develop the foundational life skills that they need to overcome challenges, make important choices that they need to make in their lives, change social norms. And we use this generate this evidence that we generate to advocate with government on the importance of investing in uh, educational programs around life skills and around gender equality. As Giovanna said in the beginning, very soon we realized that putting the entire responsibility on girls and even on teachers to alone uh, support uh, the, the battle for better gender norms and more gender equal societies wasn't fair. And so we have started thinking about ways to involve more the broader community. We have done that for many years through teachers and in community engagement through parents. And a couple of years ago, um, actually, we started talking about how we could bring some of the incredible results that we have had for girls for boys. When I say incredible results, this is some of the things that we managed to achieve through the girls education program in those very many years we have 96. 97% of the girls in our program that advance to the next grade level in communities where dropout is very, very common. 70% of our alumni report that they're either enrolled in tertiary education or have found employment within one year of graduation, and 90% of them after five years. And overall, we have seen, even through external evaluations and randomized control trials, positive impact on reduction of drop rates, gender equality attitudes and so on. So the question on how about the voice has been with us for a while and really what's that broader gender equality goal. And so we have worked with Equimundo um, on developing, testing, researching, and uh, beginning to evaluate a project involving boys in a life skills and gender equality program in Cambodia. Really trying to bring boys to promote the critical reflection around gender norms, stereotypes, supporting them to redefine manhood and develop also the skills that were so appealing to them as they saw girls improve their educational outcomes and succeed in schools. And so the program is really uh, in some ways a mix of life skills and gender equality attitudes. Again, understanding that for many parents and teachers and also the boys themselves, gender equality seemed a very hard term and a very hard set of topics to discuss. And therefore the entry point of helping them on the life skill piece was particularly appealing. This is just some of the sessions that we that we deliver. And some of them are together with girls, some of them are with boys. Over uh, with boys alone. Overall, we have seen 
some interesting results um, when it comes to the first year of the pilot. We have started with the two-year pilot, had a very um, deep evaluation, both on the quantitative and the qualitative side of some of the results, and are still in the process of analyzing those. But overall, what we have been seeing is that boys have expressed a lot of interest in sessions that have to do with some life skills. Uh, one of them, for example, that they uh, all reported really uh, enjoying was um, a session on confidentiality where the boys talk about and learn about whom is a safe person to talk to about certain topics, what is something that you should be keeping to yourself or can be keeping to yourself and something that instead you have to report to an adult. They have been enjoying um, sessions that talk about succeeding in school and how to manage your homework, but also they have expressed a lot of interest in sessions that talk about power, gender and power. So there has been really a mix in their in their preferences parents have shared that boys have actually started helping more at home with the housework and um the schools have also reported that boys have better behavior towards the girls and toward you know among boys with less fights and conflicts but not necessarily always better grades. It could be only after one year of the program, you know, this, this might not be reflected or it could be, you know, that ultimately this wasn't the main goal of the program, but this is something that we are uh, keeping looking at. And actually something we found really interesting was that very many teachers reported wanting to know more, uh, wanting to be trained more on, on, on this, and that they themselves had started challenging the social and gender norms that they were working with because of, of the program, because of being exposed to this type, of, this type of context. So these are just some of the learnings that we got through the very first year of, of this evaluation. We're going to have more results at the end of this school year. And overall, I just want to share with you um, one, one story that we heard of a grade seven student really uh, talking to us as he was beginning to um, challenge some of the gender stereotypes and, and norms in his community. And he reported to us that he was struggling to fight against a gender stereotype based on a proverb that many people in his community believe, like father, like son. And he told us, to me, it is such a negative norm because I will never copy the ways that my father used alcohol, domestic violence, and bad words to overcome challenges. And so those are just some of the... Um, you know, the things that keep us really invested in this work and wanting to wanting to continue learning how to further support boys, both in their schooling and educational outcomes, as well as the challenging of harmful norms. Thanks, Lucina, for those reflections. And I think they, they become vital if we think about the scale of the problem, the 250 million plus children of school age who are out of school, you know, I think we do have to think of the scale that Room to Read has achieved with your programming. So thank you for sharing that. I think it's also key that you, you talk about, you know, building into the pedagogy, critical reflections about masculinities, what harmful norms about manhood, the man box, whatever we want to call it, how those matter and how engaging boys in that critical reflection as a key part of a gender transformative educational approach. And thanks for sharing as well that, you know, you're on a journey and learning on this, um, these are not sort of, you know, one one quick program and we will have resolved all of boys or girls educational issues. So thank you for those reflections. Um, we're going to now go back to some questions for, for each of you, and I'll start with uh, Matthias. Um, Matthias, you, uh, you noted the report, the UNESCO report has lots of recommendations around educational policy and pedagogy, pedagogical practices. Um, tell us what UNESCO is doing or planning to do on implementing those recommendations, challenges that you that you face that are ahead of you to do this. 
Thank you, Gary. And I'm really enjoying the interventions of other participants in the discussions. Um, well, UNESCO has identified those recommendations where it can take the lead to implement them and has also started discussions with partners on recommendations that fall in their area of uh, expertise. Um, so as a first step, UNESCO has set up, set up a consortium to address boys engagement from education. And the proposed consortium will generate research to further build evidence uh, on boys engagement from education, implement programs um, and put the evidence to work and raise awareness on boys' needs and promising practices to meet them. And the founding members of the consortium are the Commonwealth Secretariat, it's you, Gary Equimundo, and your team, um, the International Center for Research in Women, um, it's us, UNESCO, and the University of East Anglia. Now, um, two key co recommendations of the report were, one, to support governments to enhance intersectional analysis on boys and, and young men for policy decisions, and two, to develop gender responsive education sector plans and policies to address challenges that are specific to boys. And now UNESCO has done a gender analysis to inform the preparation of the education sector plans of Grenada, St. Lucia and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And UNESCO has also reviewed the draft education sector plan of Dominica with a view to gender equality in and through education. And together with the UNESCO International Institute for Educational Planning, we provided a, a training to Ministry of Staff from all four countries on how to make the education plans gender responsive. And this also included raising awareness of, on challenges specific to boys. An important recommendation emanating from the UNESCO report is to target and include boys and girls to challenge harmful gender norms and engage critically with restrictive masculinities. Now UNESCO has implemented a program on positive masculinities in Guatemala in this respect. The program drew on research on gender relations and masculinities in indigenous contexts. And it was delivered in UNESCO Malana Ministry of Education centers established by UNESCO in Totonicapan that were designed to expand indigenous girls and women's access to education. And here the program trained adolescents and young men aiming to construct new nonviolent ways of thinking and exercising masculinities in their communities. Now, there's evidence from some countries that the economic, fiscal, and social cost of boys not completing basic education can be very high. The same is true for girls. So one of the recommendations in the report is to conduct research on the economic and social cost of boys' engagement from education. So over the next months, UNESCO, together with the OECD and the Commonwealth Secretariat, will develop a study on the economic, fiscal, and social costs of out-of-school children and youth disengagement from education. And as our report has shown, um, gender stereotypes that are linked to unequal power relations and negative notions of masculinities, they actually further disengage boys from schooling, potentially exposing them to risky behavior, crime, and violence. In that respect, in South Sudan, and UNESCO and partners are using a comprehensive approach, working directly with youth gang members and others at risk youth in Wawutown to reduce conflict and violence to stimulate trauma healing, confidence, and psychosocial well-being, and also to build positive relationships, skills, and behavior change for youth to become agents of peace within their communities. And last but not least, our office in Kingston, Jamaica, is planning to develop a systematic framework um, to identify children and youth, and youth at risk of involvement in violence and effective measures. And the goal is here to develop an approach and diagnostic tools that can bring about a permanent reduction in level of violence in Jamaica. And once this framework is developed, targeted interventions will be implemented. And if every, anyone in the audience today is interested in our work, we would love to hear from you. So please do get in touch. Thank you. Thanks, Matthias. And I think um, you brought the important issue of um, how much violence is part of boys' school experiences, both violence between boys, but certainly also violence by boys against girls. Um, and I think that's an issue that we often don't think about, but how much that determines or influences learning outcomes. Um, and also just thank you for sharing the examples of, of the number of partnerships, particularly with the education sector. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing those. I want to turn back to Lucina now. Lucina, you... Um, you mentioned some of the approaches that uh, Room to Read is now taking around engaging boys and thinking about gender synchronized programs where you look at engaging boys and girls to promote healthy um, relations between boys and girls and healthy um, learning environments. Um, tell us what you're learning about engaging boys in those process. You started some of that. Um, and tell us how this is influencing the way that Room to Read works with girls as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Gary. So some of the some of the sessions in the program for boys and also in our work with girls are only of girls and only of boys. So they are separate. And those are actually very interesting. We get to deep, deep dive on issues of, for example, sexual reproductive health or violence and really talk about things uh, that, that kids have expressed was being more comfortable talking about in a same sex environment. And in general, this is their comfort level. So over and over, this is what they, we have heard. At the same time, we have also seen um, and heard that there is a benefit in the co-ed sessions as girls and boys are getting to see each other in a different light. So from the sessions with uh, that are together, we hear that girls feel more empowered to speaking out in environments where generally they were more silent and boys have started seeing them in some ways as role models because they see that they are more outspoken. Um, at the same time, also boys have started um, reflecting on wanting to give them more opportunities at certain times thinking twice before talking to the girls because they realized maybe before they were doing more talking than listening. And so there is uh, some, some positive change in norms, even though after one year only, there is still a certain level of discomfort or embarrassment. And so we are working with them to make sure that we work maybe outside of school too, or that's a venue that we consider to give boys and girls more opportunities to interact, particularly in contexts where generally, uh, you know, boys and girls live pretty sex segregated lives and they do not have friends, uh, you know, of the, of the other gender and so on. So in the, so these are some of the learnings from the first part of the program. Overall, though, what we have also done has really been to look at our entire curriculum because the work with boys that is so deep on the side of gender norms and on the side of challenging masculinity has brought us to really understand how maybe we weren't doing the same to the same extent and as much as we would have liked when it comes to the girls. And so we have relooked really at the entire seven years of our curriculum, each and every session to make sure that we also uh, shared about the gender norms in the same ways. And we talked about girls, for example, are, of uh, sexual reproductive health when it comes to boys. So the same way we started talking about menstruation with boys. So, you know, that they can be supportive in uh, fighting against the stigmatization of menstruation in many communities. We have also started to talking uh, about boys' uh, bodies to girls in a way that we hadn't done before. And so this process has been extremely helpful for us, again, to try and bring an ever stronger gender transformative lens to our work. And this, of course, always comes also with the need for more involvement with teachers, with families, with communities, because the more you get to the gender transformative side of things, the higher is in some ways the risk of you know backlash or communities not understanding and so we are right now working with with this balance trying to be as gender transformative as you can while at the same time being clear and 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 you know working with programs that are going to be welcomed from the communities where we work Thanks, Lucina. And I think it's important that you, you know, we use the the jargon in our space of gender synchronized and gender transformative. But I think you you, you explain clearly there what it means that it is, you know, it's boys and girls working often together to take on harmful gender norms and gender inequalities and finding um, at moments where boys can be allies for the issues that girls face, girls being part of challenging harmful ideas about masculinities that also cause harm in boys' lives. And then I think you also highlight what's really important, which is the political challenges. We know that in many settings, um, to ask questions about harmful masculinities turns into, or gender in general, um, too often turns into some political challenges that we face at the community level and sometimes even at the national level. So thank you for, for highlighting all of those issues. Um, I want to turn back to Antara now. 
Um, like Room to Read, Angai has been um, working and much of its work historically has been with girls for many, many um, important and, and major reasons, but you've now also started doing some work with boys. Um, could you tell us a little bit about more of Ungai's work to fight gender stereotypes in education and Ungai's plans for, for your continuing work on this in the future? Thank you for that, and Luciana, so wonderful to hear of your, hear your reflections as well. Um, I wanted to, I guess, first take up the term gender transformative and, and perhaps reflect that to transform a gender norm is perhaps the deepest battle of our civilization. So it is not an easy thing to do. And we use the term gender transformative education very often. And, and sometimes I think without thinking about what it is we are asking of ourselves. I can say right now that we are trying to transform gender norms. We are trying um, to get to that, but at the very, at the best we are gender responsive. To say that you have transformed a gender norm means that a woman and a man, not a girl and a boy, but a woman and a man in that community have equal power and equal sharing of resources. And it is very difficult to point to any community in the world that has gotten to that. So just wanted to start with that with that reflection. We work a lot, um, we, we started working on what we call a program to end gender stereotypes in classrooms. Um, and this is how do we, utilize the massive potential of the entire education ecosystem. So the classroom, the teachers, the children, the parents, the spaces, the roots to help children ask questions. Um, and in fact, the impact of any programming you see on ending gender stereotypes that reaches uh, or children of all genders, you actually see a, 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 a huge change in reported uh, uh, changes in attitudes and behaviors more in boys than in girls. So when I was doing this work and we asked these children for two weeks to keep a diary of how many hours does your mom sleep, does your dad sleep, does your mom do chores, your dad do chores, watch TV, leisure, work, so on and so forth. And they obviously came back saying, yeah, my mom sleeps five hours, my dad sleeps eight hours, my mom barely watches TV and my dad you know, goes to the tea stall and my mom doesn't. The girls sort of reported back like, yeah, duh, that's how life is. The boys came back and these were 10 to 12 year old boys, rural boys, semi-literate, uh, agricultural, and they were enraged. They were so angry because they loved their mothers and they hadn't seen that this is what was going on in their homes. So they were angry with themselves. They were angry with their, with their fathers, with their mothers. But that anger was also masking sadness and vulnerability and helplessness. So just in the way they were expressing themselves was also an expression of socialization. So we are, I'm happy to report that we are now going to be actually uh, doing more of this work. We are being funded by Echidna Giving to scale up this work. We have formed a coalition of actors who are working on addressing harmful gender norms through education. And if you're interested in joining that coalition, please do reach out to us. I'll, I'll put my email address in the, in the chat. And the one last point I wanna make is, when we look at educational statistics and indicators on gender, it's really important that we keep correlating that back with other gender indicators. So for example, when we talk about educational attainment and boys and young men going to tertiary education, we need to correlate that back to statistics like what percentage of women are in parliament, less than 23% even today. What percentage of women are in, are in boards around the world, less than 24% even today, and that's much less in developing countries. This is not to take away from the importance of working on supporting every child and every young person to go to school and university, but it is to remind ourselves that we need to analyze the data and look at who gets to be where because gender equality is intersectional. And so when we, and I saw an, an, an amazing comment from a colleague in chat in Brazil, when we talk about boys being disenfranchised and young men being disenfranchised, we have to talk about where they are coming from and, and which sections of society, which classes, what poverty levels they are coming from, because we cannot support them without that intersectional understanding. I'll stop there. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, thanks for that, Antar. And I think um, first, you know, I appreciate your comments about what is gender transformative? How do we measure it? What does it mean when we achieve it? Because it's an easy expression to use, but achieving it 
um, we know is a is a far more challenging thing. And I think your reflections as well about how do we build in really a critical reflection pedagogy so that boys and girls become part of that transformation. Um, and just, you know, what that is, re what's required in that to build it into education systems. And I appreciate your final comment, which lends, you know, it does require us to say there is no simple, you know, that this finding about boys' educational challenges um, <clears throat> does not mean the patriarchy is being shaken at its, you know, at its base. In fact, lots of men are still holding positions of power. So even if some boys are faring poorly at school, um, there are certainly ways that power continues to work um, to put men in positions of power, the examples you gave in um, in state houses and parliaments and congresses, and then in the corporate sector and the workplace across the world. So thank you for that. I think we we do have to look at power in the, in those complex ways. So I appreciate those reflections. Um, Laura, I want to turn to you for a last question, then we'll take some questions from participants. Um, your report and in your comments, you were very careful to talk about just how context and regional specific these issues are. Um, and so we'd love some reflections from you on what do you see as, you know, how do these issues play out in different regions? And particularly, um, how do you see some of the issues playing out in some middle and higher income countries in terms of boys and education? Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Gary. And um, it's been really great to, to listen to all the other speakers and some um, excellent questions coming through um, and the Q&A as well. Um, but yes, we certainly found that the issues of boys' educational underachievement um, were very context specific. Um, actually, I've worked for many years in Saudi Arabia where the biggest gender gaps in um, uh, uh, student achievement in the world are found. And there are several obviously very unique factors there, including gender segregated classes from grade one. Um, but large gaps are also found in um, countries with quite different contexts to Saudi Arabia, such as in the Philippines or in South Africa. Um, it's a complex landscape. Um, in our report, we definitely found differences across and within countries, um, but also certainly some commonalities. Um, for example, uh, the issue affects all country income levels to some degree, but seems to become uh, more predominant as countries develop economically to become middle income and then high income countries. And um, perhaps this is something to do with a lag between the education expansion that has happened in those uh, in that development and the quality of education, um, which tends to lag the expansion. Um, secondly, another commonality that tends to occur more among the less advantaged and the least proficient. Um, thirdly, it's generally greater in rural areas compared to urban, at least for around two thirds of the country. Um, and um, the, la the last commonality I see is that really very few countries have done anything about it, um, even though it has been studied for some time, um, at least in high income countries. And in this respect, I would say that it's actually a looming issue for low income countries too, seeing the trajectory that countries seem to be experiencing as their, common, uh, their economies um, and education systems develop. And I think, you know, we hope to look to the better performing education systems for clues onto how to better um, cater education systems to boys' needs and at least getting them to meet, um, you know, uh, minimum proficiencies. Um, and one thing to, to bear in mind is that the gap itself is not so much the issue, but the underachievement of any group of young, uh, children and young people is the main issue. Um, one last thought. Um, in terms of looming issues, especially for middle income and high income countries is around labor market incentives and changes in skills that labor markets require, plus the implications of that for education systems. Um, while we see that incentives to continue education and enter the labor force um, can be different for men and women, um, and there are some unusual patterns. For example, we talk in our report about the US having around three decades now of downward trends of males um, in terms of skills acquisition, employment rates, um, occupational stature and real wage levels. Um, but that hasn't incentivized men to enroll into tertiary education. And so there are some several theories around that. But with the changing needs for labor as technology advances, um, there's also need for now for more collaborative problem solving um, and interpersonal skills um, and less need for the routine types of skills. Um, which means there might may be an even greater need to examine how education systems are fostering those types of skills among boys 
Um, at the same time, really making sure that they don't underperform um, in some of the foundational skills too early or for too long. Um, so it becomes just too hard for them to catch up. Um, and this, uh, especially um, coming out of the COVID pandemic is really, I think, at the forefront of our, our thinking at the moment. Um, I think somebody raised a question about that. The report uses data um, pre-COVID. Um, so this idea of boys perhaps um, falling out of tertiary education because they've really fallen too far behind earlier on could be a very big looming issue um, as we start to see what comes out of the um, COVID recovery. Um, again, all of this needs, I think, a lot more research, more discussion um, at a country level, uh, also in terms of the common themes across um, across regions and um, and across those three sort of areas that I've mentioned on labour market influences, social norms, and the characteristics of the education systems, uh, especially given you know how it is becoming more seemingly more pervasive. Um, thanks, Gary. Thanks for that, Lauren. I think th thanks in particular for bringing up, um, you know, we're, we're using this gender lens because it's one of the kind of the simple ways that we have to gather data on what happens in schools, but that so much of it is related to poverty um, and opportunities. And I think particularly the linkages to what's available in the labor market in a given setting. Um, and we haven't, you know, as you noted, most of this data is pre-COVID. We've not talked about this in light of the tremendous challenges that we know women have faced um, globally in terms of employment and paid work um, as well and coming out of COVID. So um, thank you for bringing that complexity to it. And for the honesty of just acknowledging how few countries have actually come up with national policies that have shown any effectiveness on these issues. So um, thank you. I think it's important that we step into the conversations with that, with that clarity of just how much still needs to be done. Um, I want to hand over to, to Caroline now um, for some of the questions um, from from the participants, and then we'll we'll field those and hand those to the to the different uh, panelists. Thanks, Gary. Um, so yeah, we've had some great questions in the chat so far, um, and I'm sensitive of time, so I'm just going to try and combine some of them together and um, talk about some of the the key themes that are coming through in these questions. The first of which is um, about the backlash that's been happening around the world with regard to feminism and gender, ide gender identity. And so i um, wondering if some of the panelists can speak to working in reactive political environments and garnering community buy-in for some of these programs um, and implementing these tools without watering them down, considering this, um, this kind of tenuous political environment that's, um, that's happening right now. So. Um, yeah, if uh, I could kind of shoot that over to Lucina uh, first to, to answer that question, and uh, if any other panelists would like to talk about the working in uh, this environment right now, that would be great. Thank you. Yes. So working on, um, you know, this, this context of increasing, um, you know, increasing backlash, I think in, in some ways, I feel that Room to Read, uh, you know, is quite lucky in that in most of the communities where we have worked, we have long-standing relationships with families, communities, um, uh, schools, uh, teachers, those are teachers that we have worked with for many years in the context of the girls education program. Similarly, for families and communities, uh, you know, we have country offices that are in communities for very many years. The girls education program itself is seven years long. And so again, uh, there is really a buy-in in many ways from the communities on the values of the and the importance of this work on some of the results of this work. So I feel that in some ways, this level of buy-in has really been very important, has been crucial to us. And that's also why we have waited in some ways to start with this type of work, because we wanted to make sure that the communities that we worked with were ready and knew us enough to 
give us the opportunity to work on some of those, um, you know, really more challenging issues. We have seen this level of presence and uh, previous knowledge to be very important also through COVID, where we were able to still talk to the girls and reach the girls, even in context, you know, where they were no longer showing up in schools, but we had their phone numbers, could call them at home. So in some ways, I feel that this long-standing relationship, this involvement with the community through many years has given us really an important um, an important way in and something that is making it easier for us to talk about some of the trickier, uh, you know, more complicated issues that we um, that we that we want to talk about now. Thanks so much, Lucina. Um, appreciate that. If any other panelists want to jump in on this topic specifically, um, feel free to go ahead. But if not, I can jump to the next question. All right, great. Um, so there were some questions about um, fostering behavioral change, uh, not just for the students themselves, but also um, for parents and teachers specifically. And Antara talked earlier about how truly difficult it is to change social norms. And um, I think all of our panelists spoke beautifully to um, what's involved in, in that. Um, so I'd like to just possibly pop it over to Laura or Matias to talk about their data or overall reflections on moving the needle on some of these social norms and um, some, some key strategies to do that. Thanks. Uh, okay, I'll jump in first. Actually, I, I see um, the the first two questions quite related, actually. Um, from, from the level I'm sitting at in the World Bank, um, uh, we often say that data speaks and um, we use a lot of data. And um, I, I've seen actually uh, myself in some countries where um, uh, the transformation from looking at the data and hearing all sorts of reactions and responses that um, uh, from denial to, you know, some excuses and um, other exceptionalities and all sorts of things. But over time, as that data is, is um, consistent, is triangulated, is um, showing up in different ways, I've seen um, uh, countries really shift their dialogue um, and start to make that shift. So I think um, in both of those questions that you're talking about, um, it's it's often a matter of just keeping that that information flow and that discussion and that data and the conversations as we're having now, um, and and not assuming that it's it's on deaf ears. It will eventually, um, and and it has eventually led to um, some uh, uh, good interesting changes. Thanks. Let me come in on this um, after Laura. Thank you. Um, I think changing gender norms, as was mentioned, is very tough. It's it's a hard thing to do. I think it involves uh, quite frank dialogue um, with teachers, with school principals, with parents uh, and students. Um, so gender transformative um, teacher training programs uh, surely help on this, but also engaging um, in more specific programs and extracurricular programs um, with with boys and girls uh, on these issues. Let me uh, say that educated men are found to be more likely to treat women and men equally uh, and support gender equality policies. And I think that's a, a study that came out of Equimundo that showed that. Um, also, let me take the example of uh, violence, uh, which is linked to gender norms. Uh, we have worldwide an estimated 246 million children that experience school related violence every year. That's a huge number. Um, and we know that boys who have a secondary education are more likely to condemn gender-based violence. So addressing boys' engagement from and disadvantaged education could be transformative in pro promoting gender equality, reducing violence, and protecting the futures of all. But as Lucina mentioned earlier, it's not only about education, but it's also that education is gender transformative and it is challenging really those harmful gender norms and harmful and restrictive masculinities. Thank you. 
Thanks, Matthias. Um, we had another question come through the chat um, about mainstreaming GBV topics in high school. Um, and that's happening, you know, at the school level, but how do we scale that up to the community level in terms of um, influencing uh, healthy masculinities and um, boys' education? So, Antara, great. I'm glad you came up on screen. I was going to ask you to speak to that a little bit. Thank you, Caroline, and thank you for that question. Um, uh, we in Angai, we, we, we co-chair with UNESCO, uh, a global working group on ending school-related gender-based violence. Uh, and if you go to our website or to UNESCO's website, you'll see information on that. And what we found, um, and this working group has over 50 organizations around the world. Um, some are local grassroots, some are global. And putting together all of our research and all of our efforts, what we found is, to really shift the needle on violence is a very difficult, it can be done, uh, but to do it in a sustainable way, you have to take a whole of school approach, which means um, it's not just about targeting certain behaviors and saying, okay, zero tolerance for this, that's an important starting point, but then what are you doing to reinforce that? What are you doing to help people look at that behavior differently? Um, for example, in, in one of our projects, we found that um, reporting of, of gender-based violence went up by 400%. And you know, our, our, our partners at the Ministry of Education were, were very, very upset by this. And what we were saying to them was, this is fantastic because this means that people are both recognizing that what was a normalized invisible form of violence is actually unacceptable and against the rights of the child, but also there is increasing um, ability, comfort, trust to say those things, which means that the teachers and the administration are creating that space of, of making it safe to do that. That result is very rare, actually. In a lot of cases, what we do find is that people don't feel comfortable reporting. So when I say whole of school approach, I'm, the reason I'm going into depth in this one point is to illustrate that to change the occurrence of violence, the prevalence of violence, there is so much work to do on helping everybody, not just the child, but all the adults in his or her or their world realize that X, Y, Z uh, actions are without consent and therefore not okay, and I have rights. It's sort of like this continuous process. So we have this whole framework around the whole school approach. Um, I strongly recommend that um, uh, you, you go and check it out. I'll pop the link in the chat too, thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, just if I could ask Giovanna to kind of um, piggyback off of the topic of the whole of school approach. Um, lots of questions coming through the chat about engaging teachers and, um, and parents in this issue. And I was hoping, Giovanna, if you could speak to um, Equimundo's GBI work that's happening right now in the UK that really um, applies this in practice. Absolutely. Thank you, Caroline. And I think this builds on what Lucina was saying originally, that is, if we want to work effectively in schools with teachers that, as in the questions was coming up very clearly, with teachers that are overwhelmed and have no time for additional work uh, on top of their curriculum, uh, we really need to invest time in building relationships with schools, first of all. And this means that even though, let's say, a project may have a one-year timeline for implementation, we need to have an equal amount of time to build those relationships if we don't have them already. And that's an important message, I think, to funders to be aware of the fact that not only building the capacity of teachers, but building the relationship with the ecosystem in the schools, with the principals, with the head teachers, with those who play a role in supporting them, the teachers um, develop and, 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 and deliver this intervention is crucial. So that's the first point. The second point that we're doing as part of the Global Boyhood Initiative is really trying to go beyond what we call the program box. That is, as you know, there is a wealth of evidence about the effectiveness of intervention targeting boys and girls and trying to change gender norms and behaviors within community setting or in after school programs, um, usually implemented by uh, NGO workers. The challenge as we move forward is to really tra transfer this into a school system where these interventions can be implemented by teachers themselves. And so to do this, we need to invest in ways that uh, can build the capacity of teachers in a sustainable way while maintaining the quality of the intervention. So in the UK, we support 
from the Cummings Foundation, we've been working now for the last couple of years with a great NGO partner, uh, Lifting Limits, really to uh, help teacher incorporate uh, the work that we've been discussing about dismantling harmful gender norms as part of their uh, weekly uh, hour devoted to uh, PAs, PSHE, that is the personal, social, health and economics hours that is devoted um, to this general topic in, uh, in UK schools. So that's one way, of course, again, this requires change in the ways in which we work. This requires a lot of pilot testing uh, and uh, really listening to teachers, understanding what their concerns are, helping them also address parents' concerns. So that's why we also encourage this kind of intergenerational work as we target boys and girls in schools. We also need to think about ways in which we can prevent and address parents' concerns, especially given the backlash that we're hearing in many settings. I will stop here, conscious of time, and uh, Caroline, back to you. Thanks so much. Um, so I just wanted to, sorry. Um, so we, Everyone for joining and with that i'll hand it over to gary first i want to thank the panelists for um your insights your reflections i think um you know you all offered insights that stepped away from any you know there's one one simple solution that will fix all this i think looking at the complexity um, and recognizing that is where we have to start on this i want to just offer a few kind of reflections on where we you know where to go next on this one i think all of us have emphasized just how much that gendered norms, harmful ideas about masculinity is harmful power structures that give boys and men more power and some boys and men more power over others are so key to this. And if masculinities are a part of this, um, I think there's reason to be quite concerned. We know from the data that uh, Matthias mentioned, our International Men and Gender Equality Survey, we just did a review of 30 plus countries over the 10 years we've carried it out. And actually, young men are going backwards um, in terms of attitudes around health and equitable masculinities. We are not winning the global battle of engaging men to be allies for healthier, equitable ideas about manhood. We know from other survey research that upwards of 50% of young men in some countries saying they think feminism has gone too far. There's been too much attention to gender equality when we have not achieved that equality. So I bring that up just to say we should be concerned um, for how much if these harmful ideas about masculinities are part of the issue, we do have to go in with eyes wide open of how big of a challenge that is. Um, and we have to acknowledge, and we talked a little bit about the backlash, but there are deliberate political movements that are pushing back on this agenda for healthy, equitable ideas about masculinities, for power equality between women and men. And that relates to my second point, which we didn't talk much about, which is the online lives of boys and girls. Um, in many countries, we're seeing just how many hours boys in particular are spending online, how they're spending that time online, the messages they're finding online. Certainly, we know that in many parts of the world, parents are particularly worried about the online promoters of misogyny that are active and also quite organized and using powerful algorithms to promote unhealthy ideas about masculinity is also something that we need to be concerned about. Third, we didn't talk much about mental health. There's been a huge attention to the mental health of young people and how that plays out in gendered ways. Um, for boys and girls and how that influences the learning setting. So I'm, I'm not offering any easy solutions. In fact, bringing some more thoughts of issues that I think we need to bring into this. Um, I do want to end on an optimistic note, and I appreciated that Giovanna brought some reflections from our partnership in the UK. And I had the chance um, just a couple of months ago to be in a classroom where some of these conversations were taking place with boys and girls. And I think the thing that I come out with is well done gender transformative pedagogy creates its own positive ways, express their need for help um, that they could see immediately the utility of that and that they could offer each other help and support. 
girls part of that conversation as well, able to engage boys as allies in the conversation. Teachers saying, not only did this improve gender norms, but things got better in the classroom overall. The school headmaster saying, this is so powerful, we actually want to devote some more time to it because it's we're seeing the results in terms of educational outcomes. Parents giving positive, positive feedback to the head of the to the headmaster as well. So I give all those examples to say when we can do it, when we can take the time to do it, I think truly gender transformative educational and pedagogical approaches, when they can pay attention to that ecosystem of the school, I do think they can work. And I think that's what we've got to lean into. Um, and, and I echo the colleagues who said we need more research on what that takes. What does it take to take it to scale? What are those practices and how do we how do we make those more universal? Um, again, I want to thank all the, the participants. Um, stay tuned for future GBI webinars. Um, and we're thrilled to, to be part of these conversations. Thank you to all the participants who joined us. And as Caroline mentioned, we'll have online a recording of this. And I want to thank all the colleagues at Equimundo, our communications team, Caroline, for your support on this, and Giovanna for your leadership with the Global Boyhood Initiative. With that, thank all of you. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care. <laughs>